for me, this was the sermon I'm going to preach today, I think was almost the sermon which really inspired this series. And it's one that I'm excited to preach, but I'm going to say it may be one that you will find challenging. So stay there with me um, in it. I'm going to invite you to turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 14 and verses 22 to 29. Deuteronomy chapter 14 and verses 22 to 29. And if you're thinking on whether you should turn there or not, I would advise it because you may not believe some of the things I'm about to read. Deuteronomy chapter 14 and verses 22 to 29. And I'll be reading from the English Standard Version, no, from the New American Standard Bible, and it reads in this way. You shall certainly tithe all the produce from what you sow, which comes from the field every year. You shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God at the place where he chooses to establish his name, the tithe of your grain, your new wine, your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and your flock, so that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. But if the distance is so great for you that you are not able to bring the tithe, since the place where the Lord your God chooses to set his name is too far away from you when the Lord your God blesses you, then you shall exchange it for money and bind the money in your hand and go to the place which the Lord your God chooses. And you may spend the money on whatever your heart desires, on oxen, sheep, wine, other strong drink, or whatever your heart desires, and there you shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice you and your household. Also, you shall not neglect the Levite who is in your town, for he has no portion or inheritance among you. And at the end of every third year, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in that year, and you shall deposit it in your town. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance among you, and the stranger, the orphan, and the widow who are in your town shall come and eat and be satisfied in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand, which you do. I guess we're working under the title today, Whatever Your Heart Desires. Let's pray. Dear Lord, in these moments, we would ask that you would be here and that you would speak to us in your name. Amen. Now, I am going to confess that I have never heard tithe talked about like that. Never have I been in any church where it's come to the offering time and they've said, we're about to take the offering, so turn with me to Deuteronomy 14, 22 to 29. Because I think if we did that, we would be concerned that maybe the offering wouldn't be as big as normal. Because in this passage, it isn't about what people give to God. They separate their tithe, and then they take their tithe, and they're meant to eat their tithe in the presence of the Lord. And God says to those who may have trouble taking everything that, that he has blessed them with down to where his presence is, he says, here's what you do. You can turn it into money. And when you turn it into money, God doesn't say what I want you to do is to use that money charitably to benefit others. I want you to give it away. I want you to take it to, no. You take it down to where my name is, and there you buy whatever your heart desires. Now let me read what he says that your heart can desire. Whether it's oxen, sheep, wine. And this is where it gets a little tricky for us as Adventists. It says, other strong drink or whatever your heart desires, there you shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice you and your household. So here we have a situation where God seems to say it's okay to spend your, your, your tithe money on alcohol. It's okay for you in celebrating me to take the money which is mine and spend it on strong drink. Yeah, not sorrow. So, sorrow is good, but, but, but it's not sorrow here. And again, this, this, I'm going to admit, the first time I read this text, I was disturbed. 
Because this is a very disturbing text as an Adventist. And for me as a pastor, it's even more disturbing. Because I earn my wage from people's time. And so in thinking about preaching on this passage, the concern is always, well, if people see this, they'll start to say, you know what, pastor? I want to follow the Bible. And what the Bible says is that I need to take my tithe and buy whatever my heart desires. Now, here's the thing with this text, especially in being Adventist and some of the things as we talked about in Sabbath school that we have been taught or that we have thought, it is easy to get caught up in the fact that it's talking about the tithes, that it's whatever your heart desires, and that potentially it mentions strong drink. This isn't a sermon about any of those things. This is a sermon about the bigger picture. So hopefully, you can hold those things and not have a heart attack about it right now. And just go with me as we take a little time to look at the bigger picture, because what the bigger picture of this passage says, I think, is even more important. So, I want to read it to you again. Deuteronomy 14, 22 to 29, and see the text as a whole. It says, you shall certainly tithe all the produce from what you sow, which comes from the field every year. You shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God, at the place where he chooses to establish his name, the tithe of your grain, your new wine, your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and your flock, so that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. But if the distance is so great for you, that you are not able to bring the tithe, since the place where the Lord your God chooses to set his name is too far away from you when the Lord your God blesses you, then you shall exchange it for money. And bind the money in your hand and go to the place which the Lord your God chooses. And you may spend the money on whatever your heart desires. On oxen, sheep, wine, other strong drink, or whatever your heart desires. And there you shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice, you and your household. Also, you shall not neglect the Levite who is in your town, for he has no portion or inheritance among you. At the end of every third year, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in that year, and you shall deposit it in your towns. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance among you, and the stranger, the orphan, and the widow who are in your town, shall come and eat and be satisfied, in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. I think in this passage, God says something extremely important about the cost of living. In fact, he says something so important that if we miss this point, I don't think we can ever fully experience life as God intended it to be. And if I'm being perfectly honest, I think specifically as Adventists, it may be a point we've been missing for a while. So if you go through and you look at verse 22 to 26, God says a couple of things about how the Israelites are meant to use or spend or what they're meant to do with their time. Firstly, you've got to remember that they were an agricultural society. So everybody pretty much was a farmer or some kind of manual laborer. And what would happen is at the end of the year, you get your produce and like we do, you give 10% to God. But in giving 10% to God, what they were told is that they were to take their 10% of their produce from what they sow, which comes from their field every year. And in taking that 10%, they were to take it to the place where the Lord God had his name, and they were to eat it there in the presence of the Lord their God. So they took their tithe, and what they did is they ate their tithe in the presence of God. This wasn't something that they always gave away. And then what would happen every third year or so is that rather than take it down there, it would remain in the town and it would go to the Levites and orphans and other people. But if for whatever reason you had had such a good year and you lived so far away that it wasn't possible for you to take 10% of your produce down to the place where the Lord your God had left his name, then God says, here's what you do. I don't want you to miss out. I still want you to bring a representation of that before me, so sell it. Sell your tithe, get the money, and bring the money with you, and take the money, and you can spend it on whatever you want. 
So you have to still take it down there, and you still have to bring this 10% before God. But the crazy thing is, and I, I don't, no one ever talks about spending tithe apart from the church. Like if you talked about spending your tithe on whatever you want, there would be some issues. We would talk about a need for spiritual growth. And how we have to have certain conversations because that's not appropriate. You know the tithe belongs to God. And it seems that it belongs to God here. But he says you spend it on whatever you want. So, like Daniel, if you're a vegetarian, you're going to make sure you buy the most vegetables you possibly can to celebrate before the Lord. If in some of the ways, you know, you may not be vegetarian. And you want to feel that, that, that you want a little bit of lamb or whatever. You can go and you, you don't even have to think about price. As long as it's in the tithe budget. You can spend that and buy whatever lamb you want and then you eat it before the Lord. And maybe you're not a person who likes lamb. If you're not a person who likes lamb and, 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 and you prefer something to drink, according to this text, it's wine or straw. You are free to buy that too with your tithe money. And drink it before the Lord. And it's really interesting because that says something about God. Firstly, God is not prescriptive. Because he could have said, what I want you to get is five cabbages, a couple cauliflowers, some bread, and some milk, and that's how you celebrate. But right here in this text, in terms of people celebrating before the Lord, you get and you see that God is not there saying, this is how you have to honor me. There is some flexibility for everybody in terms of what is it that brings you joy? You can spend it on whatever your heart desires. And the crazy thing about this text is that if you read verse 26, God says it twice. Just in case you missed it the first time. In the beginning, he says, and you may spend the money on whatever your heart desires. And then lists it. And then at the end, he says again, or whatever your heart desires. If what I've listed isn't what your heart desires, spend it on whatever your heart desires and celebrate in my presence. And there's something really interesting about this passage. Something that you wouldn't notice or think about. Because here is the thing. This isn't a text which says you only take your 10% and celebrate before the Lord when the 10% is bigger than last year's. It's not a text which says you only celebrate when it increases. So what could happen in the life of an Israelite is that you go down one year and it's a big year. Such a big year that you have to turn it into money and you spend it. But next year things aren't so good. So now you don't need to turn it into money. Now you can fit everything in the back of your car and you can still go down and celebrate before the Lord. It isn't conditional on it getting bigger. And for me, that's so interesting because when it comes to celebration for us, we, we celebrate bigger. We celebrate another year of life. We celebrate that better job. We celebrate advancement. And we find it hard to celebrate if it isn't bigger. And here in this text, there is no stipulation on you only celebrate it as it grows. You only celebrate it as it... No. What you are celebrating is every single year the fact that you have some produce. And you're taking it and you're celebrating before the Lord. And you would read a text like this and say, what is going on here? What is the purpose? And the purpose, is, in, in some ways, is even more confusing. Because in verse 23, it says in the final sentence, when you, when you take it all down, the purpose is so that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. And if you think about it, that sounds crazy, because when is... When is the last time you have ever heard about fear being increased through celebration? When's the last time you've been like, you know, I need to learn to fear this person more, so I'm going to go to their birthday party? Fear and celebration aren't the same thing. They, they, they are not even in the same ballpark, but that says something about what it means to fear the Lord. And it says something about what God is trying to communicate. Because if every year you have to go and you take 10% 
of what you have grown or of your produce or of your tithe and you take it and you eat it before the Lord and you're there to celebrate. And on those years when it's so big that you can't take it down and you have to get money, that you can't just say you're going to give some of the money to God. No, you have to take it all down and you have to spend it on whatever you want and you have to celebrate. What it does is that it reminds you that God is involved in every part of your life. But it also reminds you that that's something to celebrate. It says something about the kind of God you serve. That he would say, here is your produce. I want you to honor me. In fact, this is a crazy. What God is saying is that he is saying, I want you to honor me by enjoying yourself. That's how I want to be honored in your life. I want you to honor me by enjoying yourself. And to make sure you enjoy yourself, in, like with your tithe, I'm not going to tell you how to spend it. Because I know for some of you, oxtail isn't a thing. So if you don't like oxtail, you don't have to have oxtail. You can just have a great party and just drink all, like whatever you want to do, I want you to celebrate my involvement and my blessing in your life by enjoying yourself. And I think this text says something very simple but very important and something that we never really get told in church. And it's this, that celebration invites you into a life with God. That in terms of knowing who God is and what he means for your life, and how you follow and serve him, and how you learn to fear him properly, that celebration is a vital part of that. And the truth of the matter is that we don't celebrate enough. As Christians, we don't celebrate enough. And that's why, well, as Adventists, I would say, that's why a text like this causes so much confusion. Because we know that Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We know that there is this call for us to be holy. We recognize that we cannot be like the world. But for the most part, we don't know how to celebrate. And our inability to celebrate is actually a misrepresentation of God. Our inability to be able to celebrate what he has done, our inability to be able to link him with our lives actually becomes a misrepresentation. Because how much, how much do you celebrate God? How much do you celebrate his involvement in your life? And we may say, yes, we do. But how much do you celebrate it that it feels like you're doing whatever your heart desires? that you feel free. Now, maybe God has stipulated ways in which we can celebrate him. Like, you know, coming to church is a celebration. Potluck, depending on what's happening and who's bought what, can be a celebration. But this goes deeper. Because what God is saying here is that part of life, part of really living for him includes celebration. Celebration is vital. And if I maybe step on a couple toes here, generally as Adventists, we don't celebrate Christmas because of Tammuz. We don't really celebrate Easter because it's also pagan. And that may be true, but the question we have to ask ourselves is what do we celebrate? When do we have enjoyment? When do we spend any time doing what our heart desires? And if we don't, what are we communicating about the God we serve? What are we communicating about what it means to follow God? Because it's here in his word to a point that makes us uncomfortable. That you are free to do whatever your heart desires. Not even just with your extra money, but with your tithe money. It's your tithe money. That God says, I want you to use your tithe money here in Deuteronomy. I'm going to talk about what you do with it later. But here in Deuteronomy, I want you to use your tithe money on enjoying yourself before me. With whatever I have blessed you with this year, 
me and you are going to get together and we're going to have a party. That's what the text says. And that's why we don't read it because we're not used to a God like this. We're not used to a God who encourages celebration, but the question has to become, what kind of God do we serve if it's not this God? What are we saying about our God and what it means to follow God if there is no celebration? How do you enjoy life without celebration? Because sadly, you know what, I'll speak for myself. Most of the time, when I find myself at some form of celebration, which isn't directly to do with praising God or in church, I can feel a little guilty. I'm there thinking, you know what, I, I can't let myself go too much because I'm a Christian and I'm a representative of God. I'm also a pastor and my members will happily take pictures and send them around saying that this is what pastor was getting up to. But if I was in Deuteronomy, I, I could do whatever my heart desires with the tithe money and say, you know what, this is what God is saying. But it says something about who God is. And it says something about the life he wants us to lead, where, lead, lead, where he calls us to, where he commands celebration. God in this passage is commanding celebration. And he says, guess what? You can't even tell me you can't afford it because you're using your tithe money. <laughs> like, you don't get to say it's not on the budget this year, God. You know what? I would do it. No, because it's not. Like, you're celebrating with what you're meant to give to me. But it's so important because I know this would have had a massive effect on how the people thought about God. On how their children thought about God. Because you're going down and, and say, well, when's the party happening? How's the tithe going? What do we have this year? Because the celebration needs to happen. And the celebration is going to happen. But it's a serious question. And to tell the truth, I don't really have that many answers in the sermon. This sermon is more a sermon of asking a question as a church. How do we celebrate God? How do we begin to replicate some of this kind of thing so it is a celebration? Yes, it is good for our money to go to good causes. Yes. It is important for us to help people, but it seems it's also important for there to be joy, not simply obligation. For you to be able to worship and celebrate with God in a way that speaks to you. Because if God is involved in your life like that, that is going to come. Like, no Israelite, if they took this seriously, was ever jealous of any parties that anyone who was a non-Israelite was throwing. Because again, those people have to think about the budget. Those people have to think how much they can conceivably spend. It's, it's to the point when you talk about, well, when you look, look at this passage and you think about, in fact, we'll, we'll put it this way. Imagine if you paid your tithe yearly instead of monthly. And you took everything that was 10% of your yearly salary, and you try to throw a party with it. Now, could you even, would you even feel good to spend that much money on a, on a party like that? And that's what some of these texts say, that on some level, it would almost have been impossible for the Israelites to spend everything. Like, it's, it's just too much. But that's what God is saying, that they would take their 10%, which was to be given to God, and they would celebrate what God had done in their lives, because that's the point. The only reason you were able to earn all these things was because of what God was doing in your life. The only reason the crops came through was because of what God was doing in your life. The only, th oh, the only reason that, that the job was what it was was because of what God was doing in your life. And what happens today is because we don't celebrate, we tend to celebrate only the spectacular. Only the times when things are really, really amazing. And we say, you know what, this, this, this kind of happens every year. Every month I get my paycheck. Every month, you know, I'm able to feed myself. It isn't really that spectacular. 
Because the other thing that this would have done is reminded the people that you have to celebrate the ordinary because the ordinary is actually an extraordinary blessing. It's not ordinary. Like if we think about the cost of living crisis and what people are going through and how people are struggling, yes, we are all having to tighten our belts. But the position that many of the people who are members of St. Matthew's find themselves, it isn't down simply to your hard work. The fact that you're not overly stressed yet about what's going on in the cost of living isn't simply because you made some wise decisions. It's God. And it has to be celebrated. Because if we stop thinking that it's God, if we start thinking it's what I'm doing, it's because I went to the right place to study, or because I got the right job, or because I'm willing to... No, it's not. You don't even control the fact that you're able to get out of bed in the morning and get up and go to work. You don't even control the fact that when you think about picking up a pen or typing, that your body works that way. Because one day, if your body stops doing that, you can't say, body, you need to, fix, sort, to, to sort yourself. No, you're going to the doctor to find out what's wrong and to see if it's going to be something which is permanent or if, or if there's anything you can do to maybe aid or help the process. That's how little control we have. So when we find ourselves in many of the positions we find ourselves, you have to learn to celebrate the ordinary because it's not. It's not ordinary. This is the blessings of God. What we are experiencing is the blessings of God and it needs celebrating. Now the other side of this text is that Hearing all about this celebration, especially, especially from my side of things and the church side of things, and, and why I am sure that this is not one of the readings for the offering and tithe, is because we'll get concerned that people will stop paying tithe, that they'll become selfish, that they'll say, you know, that this is what the Bible says, and I can celebrate with it. But the point of the text, and what stops that comes in verses 27, 28, and 29. It says this, also, you shall not neglect the Levite who is in your town, for he has no portion or inheritance among you. At the end of every third year, you shall bring out all the tithes of your produce in that year, and you shall deposit it in your towns. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance among you, and the stranger, the orphan, and the widow who are in your town, shall come and eat and be satisfied in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. And that's just a really complicated way of saying a very simple thing. That God's blessings to you are a cause for other people to celebrate. God's blessings to you are a cause for other people to celebrate because they should benefit from it too. So sometimes what happens with the tithe is that you celebrate, but if you're in a position where you can't spend all your tithe, or even if you're not, Every three years, somebody else benefits. You don't get just to benefit from your work all the time. You are reminded, firstly, that the work you do and how God has blessed you is not just for you. It's something that other people benefit from. Because here's the crazy thing. Even when we all go down to Jerusalem and we all take our 10%, the truth of the matter is, is that maybe... What Pastor Harewood brings is bigger than what I bring. Or what Lauren brings is bigger than what Sophie brings. And there is always that chance that we begin to get jealous. That we look, begin to look at other people's parties and think, man, this is, what's going on? How did I not get blessed like that? How did I not? But the point is you're all celebrating together. And if, well, I don't know. If you've ever been to a party or any kind of celebration where people have gathered together and they've been in the party and you've been at the party and someone said, yeah, that food isn't for you. This is just for, this is just for me. <laughs> if you have, I feel sorry for you, but you also know that was a rubbish party. 
Because it's not that, like, that's not a party where people are just doing their own thing. So if you think about it, even in the celebration and taking it to the place where the Lord has laid his name, everybody is going to benefit from how you were blessed. Because you want to share it. And guess what? You feel free to share it because God told you to use this 10% this way anyway. It's no skin off your back. But again, it shows you and it reminds you of what kind of God you serve. Because if, imagine, and this is something I really wanted to talk with the eldership about, but, you know, I'm, 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 I'm going to throw these ideas. Imagine, even if just once a year, we threw a crazy party in celebration of what God has done. Imagine. Imagine what that would do for our evangelism. For people just to come and celebrate. And, and the reason we're doing this is because God has blessed us. And we want to celebrate what God has done. Yes, the cost of living is going up, but, but we still recognize even in that God has blessed us. And hey, you're somebody who's struggling. Well, because of how he's blessed me, let me bless you. Imagine if we took time to celebrate what that would do to our own faith in God. How it would change our view of him. Because living for God should not simply be something which we feel very serious and very holy about. But here, according to God in Deuteronomy, living for him is also about whatever your heart desires about celebrating how he is blessing you, how he is moving in our lives. And the truth of the matter is, I know that at St. Matthew's, even though we've experienced grief, and even though things are getting challenging, and even though the cost of living is going up, there is still so much we have to celebrate. And if we have something to celebrate, then it's a celebration we can share with others. Because even, I also know that even in St. Matthew's, we still have among us those who we would class as blue bags or widows or orphans or those who, you know what, maybe life isn't such a celebration for at the moment. And the call is to bless them with what God has blessed us with. Because if the roles were reversed, we would want them to do the same too. This text is so important. So important. And to tell the truth, I want it to be a beginning of a conversation, not the end. Because I think as a church, widely, as an Adventist church, but especially at St. Matthew's, we can start, we need to celebrate more. And it doesn't have to be Christmas or Easter, but we've got to find something to celebrate about. Something to celebrate. Something to say that we serve a God who is so powerful in our lives that whatever is going on in the world, he is still worth celebrating. And life with him is still worth celebrating. Our Christianity is not about holding on for dear life until Jesus comes and takes us to, he to heaven. The call for celebration comes here. Because celebration teaches us something vital about God. Something that I'm ashamed to say I think we've forgotten. And something that he chooses to remind us of here. So I think the best thing I can do is just leave you with the text. Verses 24 to 26 of Deuteronomy chapter 14. But if the distance is so great for you, that you are not able to bring the tithe, since the place where the Lord your God chooses to set his name is too far away from you when the Lord your God blesses you, then you shall exchange it for money and bind the money in your hand and go to the place which the Lord your God chooses. And you may spend the money on whatever your heart desires, on oxen, sheep, wine, other strong drinks, or whatever your heart desires, and there you shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice, you and your household. It's time to learn 
out to celebrate again. Amen.